I love theater. I love the stage. I love the fact that on the stage you can be someone completely different. You can explore facets of your personality that you would never normally explore. And that's what I love about Minecraft, is you have the opportunity to play as somebody completely different. My name is Ben Spildunner. I'm an English teacher and educational technologist for Ashland High School in Ohio, and I'm also the stage director of the musicals here. One thing I've learned over the last few years about working with students on stage is that they have the opportunity to learn so much about themselves through what they do on stage. And the same is true for Minecraft Education Edition. Students learn so much about themselves through playing this character in a digital world. Episode 4 of Mind What is all about curriculum. It's all about looking at why you would use Minecraft Education and how you can effectively create an immersive environment for your students. So, enjoy Episode 4 of Mind What. Episode 4 of Mind What, we're going to take a look at the curricular side of Minecraft Education. I'm, I'm just going to give my two cents in terms of the philosophy that I think that you need to have before you begin a Minecraft Education experience with your own kids. And to start with, i got a little video to show you here about two things, metacognition and fluid intelligence. I recently saw a video by Jordan Shapiro in which he's addressing an audience about games in the classroom. In fact, at one point he says, thinking of education as play turns out to be a pretty disruptive perspective. Now, Jordan Shapiro is a writer for Forbes magazine and he writes about you know, all things games. And um, you'll see in the description below, there's a link to the video that I'm talking about. I think what you're gonna find when you start Minecraft Education Edition is that you're gonna experience that whole idea of play being a disruptive perspective. Um, what that means, at least what it's meant for me, is a lot of justification for using it in the classroom and the students will get it right away, but you need to be ready for people that might ask questions, you know, why are you doing this, you know, why are you using video games in the classroom, and really what it comes down to is informing them about the fact that video games are not just entertainment anymore, but video games are a way of engaging students and creating learning in ways that, that have never been done before. In fact, in his TED Talk to Brussels, Gabe Zickerman, who's the CEO and co-founder of Onward.org, talks about this very notion of using video games as, as a learning tool. And at one point he starts to talk about the um, two different kinds of intelligence. One of those is fluid intelligence. And when he talks about fluid intelligence, he talks about the reality that video games really meet all of the all the basic building blocks of creating fluid intelligence. In fact, I would argue probably more effectively than most uh, classroom tools. Uh, he also goes on to say that kids move faster these days and he talks about how he would, you know, he's not the kind of person that would sit down with a cup of tea and just read a good book. And if I'm gonna be honest, I'm probably not. Now I teach English and I, that's not the kind of person that, that I, I am. Now I love books and I love to read but generally speaking, I need something that's going to be fast-paced, involves me, you know, multitasking, those kinds of things. And really today's kids are the same way. When we look at building fluid intelligence, you know, when we look at the fact that our kids move faster these days, when we look at the fact that kids can multitask better these days than probably any generation before, a lot of the classroom activities that we do, that, that I've done in the classroom, don't meet a lot of those needs. So how do you do it? Well, one tool is by using video games and Minecraft Education Edition uh, to be more specific, actually. Now, I'm not suggesting that video games you know, are, are going to save education, but what I am suggesting is that video games and Minecraft Education Edition in particular are a great tool to be able to engage your students and get them to learn at the same time. So it's one tool that you can use as a classroom educator know a little more about metacognition and fluid intelligence and really how important that is in terms of making your kids more aware of their own thinking the next thing we need to take a look at is why are you going to use Minecraft education and this is an important question because what it really does is it helps you determine direction you know do I head one direction jump in with both feet and just see what happens or do I head down a different direction and I plan everything out. 
And this is really only a question that you can answer for yourself. You know your students best, you know how you best want to utilize Minecraft education. You, know, you, can, you can start with uh, a simple setup where you have a house and uh, you give them the exact materials they might need or you can set them off on their own and let them be free to explore and to create uh, their, their own way. And, and I also want to make sure that I give you permission too, to be able to, to do both with your classes and with your students. And there's not one right way to best utilize Minecraft education. That's the fun part about Minecraft education is really it's an opportunity for you to be able to, to, to play. Um, to play in a way that's, that, that's both fun for you and your students. The next question you should ask is, how am I going to create this experience through Minecraft? And that's a, that's a big question because you need to determine for yourself, am I going to make the environment something that I can control where I put all the boundaries around where I want my students to go? Or do I leave them free to explore? Once again, that's a question you have to ask for yourself, and a lot of it's going to be determined by how you plan on using Minecraft in your classroom, what kind of lessons you, know, you want to bring in your classroom, the age of your students, and even your own comfort level uh, with Minecraft as well. After you've determined why you want to use it, and even how you want to use it, the next thing you need to determine is how you're going to assess. Now. It's fitting that we have some rain, I guess, because usually assessment is the is a uh, you know one part of the the equation that becomes a little bit difficult. It's a it's a little bit harder to to see with clarity um, because it doesn't always fit a rubric well, or it doesn't always fit a letter grade well. You know this whole idea of freedom and creating and those kinds of things. So what I'm going to attempt to do now is I'm going to attempt to clear things up for you. And what I've got here is one more video to show you how it is that I approach this whole topic of rubrics and grades. One of the questions I get asked most often about using Minecraft in the classroom is, how in the world do you grade it? And that's a great question. Generally, I respond with another question. Do I always have to grade it? And that's one thing that you're going to have to figure out for yourself. Now, I'm not suggesting that you never grade it, that you never create a way to assess kids' learning uh, in Minecraft, because I believe that's really, really important. However, you have to be very mindful in doing that. And so the first thing you have to ask yourself is, you know, do I need to assess this particular activity that we're doing today, or is today's activity a part of a, of a bigger scheme? And let me give an example here. So, one of the scenarios that I created is based on Ayn Rand's book, Anthem and I recreated the world digitally in Minecraft. And we did this for uh, six days, it was not six days in a row, but six days total we had students play in the world as a character in that world. And we, we made it extremely oppressive, they had to complete one job and one task only, if they ever got out of line, we threw them in jail for the day, and then they were, you know, we let them back out uh, after that day was finished. And one thing we were trying to figure out is how do we make that punishment real? And so what we did is we decided, well, we're going to take away points every single time someone gets put in jail. Now, in the grand scheme of things, there were several ways that kids could get points. One, they just do their job, function like any other member of that society. The second way they could gain points is to do what the narrator in the book did, and that's to break out and to discover the secret house. Now, in that scenario, we did provide a grade every single day because we wanted the kids to be able to experience, you know, real loss, loss of points, those kinds of things, and to be real to them. However, in another scenario that I have with my uh, freshman students, we were doing a series of short stories uh, that involved uh, post-apocalyptic worlds, and so I dropped them into a very simple-made village in which they had to survive, and that was, their, that was their sole goal, was to survive. I didn't give them any grade for it. The reason being is because it wasn't necessarily 
about what it is that they did. I wanted them to experience what it would be like to be in a post-apocalyptic world where the only things that you get are things that you can scavenge. And what is it, you know, what is it like when you realize that you can't really escape this small village because there are monsters outside? And so we use that as part of a narrative. And so it was one piece of a larger whole. So you have to figure out, is this a scenario where I want to give them a daily grade or I don't necessarily need to give them a daily grade. This is part of a larger picture. This is more of an experience that they're going to use uh, in the overall lesson itself. The next question we may be asking is, how do I know that this has achieved the goal that I wanted it to achieve? And really the best way to do that is just, just to ask your students. You know? um, and you have to decide what it is that you want to achieve before you begin your world. You know, what's your overall goal? Um, and then once you figure out what your overall goal is, then you can figure out ways to either A, assess it using a grade of some kind, uh, or B, use that as part of a larger whole and you can do things like you know, informal discussions or, or more formal writing pieces that will maybe have grades then attached to them as well. I wouldn't get hung up on the whole grade thing though. And not because I don't think grades are important, but just because this creates an experience for the students. And sometimes if you attach a grade to those experiences, they'll be less concerned with the experience itself and more concerned with getting all the points that they need to get. Now, if that's what you want to create, like I wanted in my Anthem world, great. But if you don't want students to be more worried about the points they're getting than the overall experience itself, then maybe this is one of those things that you don't necessarily have to grade and you can have students reflect on instead. Now, in later episodes of Mind What, I'll give more specific examples as to how I actually assess my students, rubrics I use, how I go about grading, and those kinds of things. One of the last things I want to talk about is the idea of reflection. And, and I think reflecting when it comes to Minecraft Education Edition is extremely important. It's important for you as an educator. I mean, it's important for you as an educator to reflect in general. But with Minecraft Education Edition, it's important to reflect on whether or not the goals that you had in mind were actually met. You know, was the environment you created immersive? Did it do what you wanted it to do? And also to have students reflect. Reflect on what they learned, what they did. You know, did they behave differently in the world than they would in, in real life? All those kinds of things. And you can do this formally through, uh, you know, written reflections, informally through discussions. You can talk as a group or you can chat with kids one-on-one. -on -one. You can, of course, you know, make these comments public on YouTube. Um, you can make them private, have students you know, email you or use Google Classroom or those kinds of things. But reflecting is extremely important and then getting feedback from your students is also extremely important. The last video I have to show you is probably the most important video of all. And these are tips from students, not just any students, these are tips from my own kids. So I figured I needed to go to the experts, I needed to go to the two people that showed me how to use Minecraft. And so I'm going to end episode four of Mine What with some tips from my own two kids. I like that since in real life you can't, as a kid, you can't build a house and like you can't destroy stuff. That whenever you like build stuff, you can destroy it and you could like redo it but in the real world when you do it it won't work that much and i also like how when you're building and stuff you have an option of like just breaking the block and there's like tons and tons of different blocks that you can use and like i love all the different mobs and stuff and my like my favorite mob is a creeper and my favorite animal in it is probably the baby sheeps and so I like Minecraft because it's a lot different from the real wor world and you can do a lot more. Oh my gosh, th my first thought would be woohoo! <laughs> Cause like, Minecraft is my favorite game. And um, I would have so many ideas. It, <laughs> I would think it would be so much fun.
like you can help it with math because mostly it could be like times because you would have to use like certain kind of blocks to build your house um i would think like since right now like we would probably use it in science because we would like since there's all different kinds of blocks that like are like there's fire and like different blocks that can like do different things with redstone and like we would probably use it in math because redstone contains a lot of math and thinking and so i feel like in science you could use it to like get different blocks and like have ideas of what your like what would happen if you mix this and this in real life what would happen oh i think i'm better okay he's better at redstone than me uh, building houses and i think i'm better at making weird things <laughs> and blowing stuff up no um i'd say pools and like big um places oh yeah i taught him how to make an elevator i'm pretty much better at like sticky pistons and like pistons Thanks a lot for watching. Mine what? Episode 4.